The 24th of May, 2010, Bradford, England. A building caretaker sits reviewing CCTV footage as part of his regular duties, but this would not be any ordinary shift. On what would normally be a deserted corridor, a shadow appears just meters from the camera lens. Approaching the camera with ill-deserved confidence and a sick grin, a man of medium build with dark hair brazenly walks up to the camera, stares down the lens, raising his middle finger of his left hand and tightly gripping a crossbow in his right. But this was not the first encounter that this man had with serious crime. In fact, his reign of terror had begun almost 12 months earlier. This is the chilling story of the man who dubbed himself the Crossbow Cannibal and who would leave an unknown number of bodies in his wake. Before we begin, we would like to send our sincere condolences to the family and friends of Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Suzanne Blammeyer, who all had their lives cut short by one sick individual. Stephen Sean Griffiths was born on December 24, 1969. He was the firstborn son of food salesman Stephen Griffith Sr. and his mother Moira, who worked on telephone switchboards. Although his father earned an honest living, Stephen learned about crime early through his mother. Despite having a respectable job, she herself was convicted of fraud after secretly conning people out of their money. His mother and father divorced when he was only 13, when he and his siblings went to live with their mother despite her criminal record. After the divorce, Griffith's behavior seemed to change. He had always been a bit of an odd child, but nothing that concerned the family too much. Unfortunately, that was about to change. His mother lived, shall we say, a permissive lifestyle. What is stranger is that her son Stephen would spend much of his time watching her have sexual relations in the garden with multiple men. By the age of 17, Griffiths was out of control. He had little time for society or trying to fit in. From his early teens, he made a regular habit of going out shoplifting. At the age of 17, one such outing would take his activities to a whole new level. While stealing from a shop, he was spotted by the clerk who attempted to apprehend him. But Stephen wasn't going to let anyone stand in his way. After quickly drawing a knife, he slashed the man's face. Fortunately, he didn't manage to evade the law and was quickly arrested and subsequently sentenced to three years in a young offender's institute. Due to his age, he only served one year of his sentence, but on reflection, this was a mistake. During his time with probation officers and psychiatrists, he repeatedly and openly told them that he fantasized about being a serial killer. Tragically, no one seems to have taken his words very seriously, which would prove very costly later in life. But for the time being, he appeared to be making an effort to make changes in his life, having enrolled at Bradford College where he was studying psychology. The red flags never really went away for authorities. In 1989, he was in trouble again for possessing an air pistol which had been used to shoot birds and then dissect them. For this, he received 100 hours of community service. In 1990, he would graduate to far more violent crime. After meeting a girl in the street, he pounced on her and held a knife to her throat for which he was sentenced to two years in prison. It was during this time behind bars that Griffith seems to have developed an interest, or you could almost call it an infatuation, with infamous serial killers in the UK. He bought numerous books on Jack the Ripper, who was known to have killed at least five sex workers in Whitechapel, London, between 1888 and 1891, and was never caught. He also focused on the Moores murders, Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, who murdered at least five children between 1963 and 1965, burying their victims on Saddleworth Moor, which borders both Manchester and Yorkshire. Both died in prison. Finally, and disgustingly, his personal favorite was Peter Sutcliffe, also known as the Yorkshire Ripper. Sutcliffe murdered at least 13 women and was convicted of attempting to murder an additional seven others between 1975 and 1980. Having first started in residential areas, then moving to more vulnerable targets, sex workers, Sutcliffe died in prison in 2020 at the age of 74. 
Despite taking time out of his education for his little visit to prison, Griffiths did continue his studies. After being released from prison, he earned his bachelor's degree in psychology and then enrolled in the University of Bradford where he began studying for his doctorate in 2004. But outside of the classroom, his behavior became more erratic. He was regularly seen walking his two pet lizards down the road on dog leads. One neighbor that was invited to his flat explained how he thrived off of watching the lizards eat live rats. One of his former friends also explained how Griffiths once ate a live rat himself in front of him. Many students get part-time jobs while studying, but not Stephen Griffiths. When he wasn't studying, he spent his time downloading and watching extremely violent pornography, fueling his not-so-well-hidden fantasies. He was now beyond being able to control his sick thoughts and fantasies and would soon begin acting them out. Susan Rushworth was a 43-year-old woman from Bradford who worked as a prostitute in the city's red light district. Susan was from a good home and a loving family, but had developed serious drug issues when she began seeing a new boyfriend. Eventually, as many others do, she graduated to the most dangerous of substances, heroin. To feed her addiction, Susan would stand on street corners until she was propositioned. Susan's family had tried their best to get her off the streets. Her mother even paid for a private rehabilitation clinic, but nothing seemed to work. The drugs had a hold of her, and with a substance like heroin, even if someone does manage to get clean, the cravings of the body never really go away. On the 22nd of June 2009, Susan had been with her family at her mother's home. She was once again trying to change her life and had begun a course of methadone, a heroin substitute given free to drug addicts in the UK to try and help them get clean. At 1 p.m., Susan started walking down to the drugstore or chemist for her medication, telling her family that she would only be gone for a couple of hours. Just after 1 p.m., she was seen boarding a bus to town where the chemist was located. Hours went by with still no word. Susan wasn't answering her phone, which the family said was very unusual for her. No matter what state of mind she was in, she would always try to stay in touch. Hours turned into days, days into weeks, but still there was no sign of Susan. Multiple public appeals were made by the police and the family, but all to no avail. Susan's family walked the streets of the red light district asking all of the women if they had seen her, but again, nothing. Police even dredged a local lake, but there was no sign of Susan anywhere. One of the women that the family spoke to was 31-year-old Shelley Armitage. Her story was very similar to that of Susan. From a good home with a loving upbringing, she had begun using drugs recreationally. But, just like Susan, her addiction escalated to using heroin. April the 26th, 2010. Just over 10 months since Susan had disappeared, Shelley was in the center of Bradford meeting with her parents. Just like Susan, she had always kept in close contact with her family, but at the same time tried to keep the details of her troubled life a secret from them as much as possible. After leaving her parents, Shelley made her way down the road to meet with a friend, phoning her sister, Gemma, on the way at approximately 3 p.m. Gemma said that Shelley was talking to someone else at the same time as being on the phone with her and said she would call back shortly. Having waited two hours, Gemma became concerned and started calling Shelley repeatedly, but there was no answer. Gemma decided to call Craig, Shelley's boyfriend, but he also said that he had not seen her. He wasn't willing to wait around to see if she reappeared either. Instead, he immediately called the police. Shelley was in receipt of state benefits, which she had not collected, and the chemist where she had gotten her methadone also confirmed that she had not been in. Something was very clearly wrong. Just like Susan's family months earlier, Shelley's family began trawling the streets and asking the other working girls if they had seen her. Shelley was slightly different to Susan in that she was very popular in the local area. Everyone knew her. But sadly, this did not help in the hunt for her. No one had seen her around. The police at this point were doing all they could. They, of course, saw the similarities between the two disappearances and suspected that the same person was possibly responsible for both Shelley and Susan's disappearance. But the lack of evidence left the investigation stalling. 
not a single witness had seen either of them, and there was only one brief image of Shelley walking down the street which didn't provide any new leads. The police were assigned large teams of officers to search the streets, parks, and basically all of the surrounding areas near the red light district. But the searches again yielded no results. Both women had disappeared without a trace. But this case was about to get even worse for the family and friends and the police that were trying to solve it. News of the girls' disappearances was spreading fast, but sadly it didn't stop the other working girls from continuing to wait on street corners, putting themselves at extreme risk. Suzanne Blaymeyers was a 36-year-old sex worker in the same area as Susan and Shelley. Sadly, she too had fallen into the trap of heroin. Suzanne and her friends began using recreational drugs when they went out around town. Thankfully, her friends were able to limit their usage to those nights out, but Suzanne was unable to do this. Unable to get a full-time job because of her drug-ridden state, she was forced to turn to prostitution to feed her addiction. Suzanne's parents were devastated when they discovered that their daughter was using heroin and tried everything they could to stop her. Her dad even used to lock her in the house in a desperate bid to stop her from getting a hold of any drugs. This did work for a time, but of course, you can't lock someone in a house indefinitely. By the 21st of May 2010, Susan had been missing for almost 11 months, and Shelley had been missing for just under one month. Suzanne Blaymeyers is dropped off at home by her mother after spending the night at her parents' home. Suzanne promised to call her mom, Nikki, sometime later that day, but that call never came. Her parents weren't too worried at the time. Despite being devastated by her life choices, they knew what she was doing to earn money and assumed that she had gone out uh, working. But the situation would become much more worrying by the next morning. A man knocked on their door. It was Suzanne's boyfriend asking if they had seen her. This was very irregular. Suzanne, just like the other girls who had gone missing, always stayed in touch, but now she had not contacted her family or boyfriend. The police were now not just searching for two girls, but three. But the police were finally about to get a new lead, a very strong one. Homefield Court is a converted block of flats situated near the red light district. A caretaker was working inside the flats three days after Suzanne's disappearance. Part of his job was to review CCTV footage from the previous days to check that nothing was out of the ordinary happening in the building. This would usually be a monotonous task, but of course, not this time. In the middle of hours of footage of an empty corridor with nothing to see but the odd passing resident, evidence presented itself. Suzanne is seen walking down the corridor with a dark-haired man and then entering his flat. Moments later, she reappears and tries to run away. The caretaker called the police immediately. The police went to see Suzanne's family straight away and informed them they believed that Suzanne may have come to serious harm. Her parents said, she's dead, isn't she? But police denied this and said they believed that she may have been seriously harmed, but they were not in a position to confirm nor deny that Suzanne was dead at this point. They didn't know what happened to her just yet. Police explained that Suzanne was pursued down the corridor by a man who was armed with, of all things, a loaded crossbow. She was dragged back to the flat, never to re-emerge. Two crossbow bolts were fired at her, with the first one missing, but the second one striking her in the head at close range. After dragging Suzanne down the corridor and back into his flat, the man realizes he's been captured on CCTV, but this doesn't worry him. In fact, it seems to have fueled his thirst for notoriety. He calmly walks down the corridor and straight up to the camera, posing with his crossbow. At the same time as Suzanne's family were being given the tragic news, the police were swooping down on Homefield Court to apprehend this man. Stephen Griffiths, the 40-year-old PhD student, was arrested. He came quietly, making little fuss, even demonstrating arrogance and a sense of pride in his actions. Griffiths was interviewed for hours, but his willingness to become notorious seems to have left him for a time. He gave very little details to the police and refused to connect himself with the disappearances of either Susan or Shelley. Despite his silence, police were about to get another breakthrough, courtesy of a member of the public. 
A man walking innocently down the banks of the river air, looking into the water, he spots what he believes to be body parts floating downstream. A rucksack was also seen floating nearby. Upon opening it, the man was horrified to see the head of Suzanne Blameyers staring back at him, with a knife and a crossbow bolt still embedded in her skull. Police divers were now assigned to search the river thoroughly. They found numerous body parts of the dismembered Suzanne, but as if that weren't bad enough, they also found other body parts belonging to Shelley Armitage. Eventually, police wore Griffiths down during the interviews, and he confessed to all three murders. Despite his confessions, he still wouldn't give up any information as to how he killed them or where all of the body parts had been dumped. To make matters worse, no remains of Susan Rushworth had been found. When asked why he needed to kill the women, Griffith said, I haven't much time for the human race. Griffith's trial began at Leeds Crown Court on the 16th of November 2010. He may have been reluctant to speak to police, but his narcissism had not left him. When he was asked his name in court, he replied, I am the crossbow cannibal. The comment left the families distraught, many of them in tears. One family member even said at the time, this man can't be human. Griffiths pled guilty to all three murders without empathy or remorse. The families had to endure a torturous trial as gruesome details of the crimes committed by Griffiths were revealed. Suzanne had been dismembered to such an extent that the police found no fewer than 81 separate body parts belonging to her. It wasn't much comfort for the family, but the police finally found the evidence of Susan Rushworth in Griffith's flat by linking bloodstains found on the bathroom wall and inside his bedroom. They were certain that she had been in the property and most likely had met her final end there. One detail that none of the families had been made aware of made many feel physically sick in court. DNA from both Susan and Shelley was found in and around his stove. Griffiths had cooked many of the body parts. Although he wouldn't admit to it, police believe that he actually ate some of those parts. To make the matters worse, Griffiths also used the lifeless corpse of his victims to take chilling photographs putting them in different positions and then keeping them in a photo album, which had to be shown in the courtroom and to the families. Disgustingly, this is not uncommon amongst serial killers. They are known as trophies. For example, Jeffrey Dahmer preserved and kept the skulls of his victims. Ted Bundy did the same thing, and John Hay, the acid bath killer, kept his victim's dog. It is also common, although you may not hear about it much, for police to secretly record the funerals of the murder victims. It is well known that murderers will often attend the funerals of the victims. This is how the sick criminal mind works. Psychologists believe that it is a way for murderers to take themselves back to the crimes they have committed when they no longer felt like pathetic nobodies and still had some power over their victims. On the 21st of December 2010, the judge, Mr. Justice Openshaw, sentenced Stephen Griffiths to three life sentences and ordered a whole life term without parole. It was little consolation for the families, but at least they could take some comfort in the fact that this monster would never walk the streets a free man again. Stephen Griffiths was well known to police, and it was revealed after the trial that he had been under police observation for two years before he began to commit murder. They were even aware that Griffiths was taking more than a passing interest in dismemberment as he was purchasing numerous books on the subject. They liaised with the housing association that was responsible for the block of flats he lived in, informing them that Griffiths was a potential risk to anyone else living there. As a result, the Housing Association installed new CCTV systems which captured Griffiths chasing Suzanne Blameyers down the corridor and eventually to her death. But of course, this did nothing to save her. Unfortunately, the police had no grounds to re-arrest Griffiths at that time or even give him an antisocial behavior order for his previous crimes he had served his time. All they could do was watch and wait for him to make the wrong move. 
Had the psychiatrist who had warned authorities of Griffith's unstable mental state had been listened to, it is possible he could have been sent to a mental hospital or sanctioned under the Mental Health Act, but unfortunately, these concerns were not acted upon. The Prime Minister of the UK at the time, David Cameron, opened a conversation about reducing the punishments handed down to women who solicit on street corners, but stopped short of holding a debate about legalizing prostitution in the UK. Some might say, in true political fashion, members of the parliament paid lip service to the crime, but after the initial shock and horror of these crimes committed by Griffiths, nothing was ever done to make these women safer. Prostitution remains illegal in the UK with a maximum punishment of seven years in prison and a £5,000 fine. It is known as the oldest profession in the world and divides opinion in many countries. Some say it is degrading and look down on people who turn to it to make money. Others say everyone has the right to use their bodies as they see fit. In countries where it is illegal, prostitution still goes on every day regardless of the potential consequences. In Amsterdam, Holland, prostitution is legal and the girls are given a safe environment to conduct their business. They have panic buttons and security guards to keep them safe, a much better environment to work in than standing on a street corner hiding from police and putting themselves at risk by getting into any passing vehicle or going to a stranger's home. This case proves that beyond a doubt. Susan, Shelley, and Suzanne had all fallen on hard times as the result of their drug addictions, but they didn't deserve to die for it. None of them were old and had many years of living ahead of them with a chance to change their lives. Through their desperation to feed their habits, they were willing to go to anyone's home to earn what money they could. All, tragically, were unfortunate enough to be approached by Stephen Griffiths, who decided the easiest way for him to commit his horrific crimes and act out his disturbing fantasies was to prey on some of the most vulnerable women in society. We will never know what they could have become in the future. All came from good homes and loving families who were willing to help and support them. There is every chance they could have turned their lives around, but thanks to the actions of one sick individual, they were not given that chance. Rest in peace, Susan Rushworth, Shelley Armitage, and Suzanne Blaymeyers. If you found this story compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. Less than half the folks who watch our videos are subscribers. It's free and easy, and it makes it possible for us to continue to bring you great true crime content. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadow.